Welcome to Clause 8, presented by Tradespace, where the voices of IP come together to talk about the forces shaping the industry today. If you enjoy this show, please take a second, subscribe on Clause8Podcast.com for updates and wherever you listen to podcasts. While you're there, we'd really appreciate a five-star review. In this episode, we're honored to be joined by Judge Timothy Dyke of the Federal Circuit. Appointed by President Clinton in 2000, Judge Dyke has had a career spanning over two decades on the bench. Eli and Judge Dyke discuss his book, Judge Dyke's thoughts on the role of appellate judges, why it's crucial to have collegiality and humility in the judiciary, and his advice for the judiciary dealing with patent cases in today's rapidly evolving technological environment. That's the greatest challenge I find as a judge here is getting to understand the technology, getting the help that you need to understand the technology. That's really hard, and we need help from the bar, we need help from our clerks, and we need to be willing to spend a lot of time to wade through it. And now, here's your host, Eli Mauser. Today, we're lucky to be joined by Judge Timothy Dyke of the Federal Circuit. He has recently written a book, The Education of a Federal Judge. I highly recommend it. It provides a lot of answers to questions that people have in recent years about the Federal Circuit. I'd like to thank my friend James Stein, an arm wrestling champion and patent attorney down in Atlanta for letting me know about the book, and to Michael Doherty for helping coordinate this Close 8 interview. Judge Dyke, thank you so much for joining Close 8. Very happy to be here. I've interviewed lots of judges, but this is my first time sitting in a chamber of a judge and doing an interview. We're at the Federal Circuit. What does this represent to you? What does this chamber represent to you? What does this building represent to you? Well, it's a privilege to be a judge. It's something I wanted to do my whole life, and I, I hope that on the bench I make a contribution as my colleagues make a contribution. Why is it something that you wanted to do your whole life? Well, uh, you know, in private practice and in law school, we always analyze appellate cases, and it's interesting to be on the other side and to actually uh, write the opinions that I spent my life reading and interpreting. I read in your book that two out of your Three kids went into law. What do you think made them want to follow your career path? I guess they saw that I enjoyed it, that I took it seriously, that it was gratifying. I'm very proud of the fact that they both became lawyers and proud of my third child, who's a journalist. Do you remember when you first heard about patents? Obviously, your, the bulk of your legal career before you joined the federal circuit didn't involve that. But do you remember when you first heard about patents? Well, I, I don't know that I have the answer to that question, but I do remember the first time that I discussed patent law with anyone. It was uh, with a uh, second cousin of mine who lived in California. I was at the Justice Department at the time. He lived on a house uh, at the top of Belvedere Island, which is expensive real estate, as you yeah. know. And I was arguing in the Ninth Circuit, and he kindly asked me to stay with him. And after the argument was over and done with, the next day, he told me that he had an office downtown where he practiced Pratt and Law, would I like to come and see it? Oh, okay. So we went down to his office, and, he, and I expected that his office would be as grand as his residence. It was not. It was a tiny office with linoleum, literally linoleum on the floor and wooden furniture. And so I think he was sending a message, a message to his clients that I'm not expensive. You're getting a good deal. <laughs> but he was a great guy. He had a yacht called Pat Pending, yeah. and which you can actually look up the yacht on the internet. It has quite a history. What did you think about the practice at the time? I didn't know much about it. I mean, he, he, he knew all the judges on the Ninth Circuit, so he must have been well-connected. But I didn't really learn anything about what patent law was like until I was at Jones Day toward the end of my career and started representing Lubrizol and its patent fights with Exxon and some other patent clients as well. And it was my first contact with it. It was really interesting, and I enjoyed very much learning about it. You mentioned before that the Federal Circuit was created, I think, in, back in 1982. Do you have any thoughts at the time? I'm sure it was a big topic of discussion in your area about a new federal appeals court being created. No, it wasn't. I was at, at the time at uh, Wilmer Cutler in 82. Yeah. I think it, nobody noticed it much. Patent law was sort of a foreign territory. And I don't think anybody in the firm in those days thought they'd ever be doing patent law. And of course, uh, a few years later, they were spending a lot of time doing patent law. You clerked on the Supreme Court. And you write very interestingly about that in the book. One of the things that you write about is the role of Earl Warren, who you were a clerk for. One thing you write is that about the previous <laughs> chief judge, you say, Winston seemed unable or unwilling to achieve unanimity. 
and holding state segregation of public schools unconstitutional, where Winston had failed, Warren succeeded. Do you admire Judge Warren for being able to reach unanimity? Is that the role of the chief judge to kind of shepherd that? Well, it is, but it was particularly important in Brown and the related cases to achieve unanimity because without it, I think the resistance to the decision and, and implementation of it would have been greater than it was, and it was significant even with the unanimity. You've had a lot of great color about Judge Warren. One thing you write is that he wasn't happy with Judge White, so he assigned him bad decisions. To, you say, and exercise his prerogative as Chief Justice to assign dog opinions to White. And you also say that Warren is undervalued because he was expert at wielding the few levers of power granted to achieve justice. I was reading it, but I was like, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Is, do you have an opinion about should achieve justice, do what is within his power to do what he thinks is right, or is he just should just take on an administrative role? Well, never, never having been chief justice, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that question. I think he, I, I think, or any, chief judge of any, court, any, any, well, a chief judge yeah. has, in some ways, less authority than the chief justice. Yeah. But I think that any chief justice walks a fine line between using the assignment power to encourage the results that he'd like and being fair to everyone on the court. And I think Warren did a good job of that. I mean, I don't think he was heavy-handed about it, but he knew what authority he had, and he used it in a measured way. You're writing about appeals court judges in general, and you say the chief judge typically sets a tone. If a chief judge sets a good tone, the court will likely be a happy court. What can a chief judge do to set a happy tone? Well, I think to be fair to colleagues, to serve the interests of the court, rather than the interests of the individual. And I think most chief judges do a good job of that. Our current chief judge does a good job of that. Our Her predecessor did it, Judge Prost. Then Chief Judge Prost did a great job of that. One thing that kind of surprised me is how much you stressed about how collegiality is important. In my mind was each judge on the federal circuit or in the appeals court is its own institution and make their own decisions and they operate from that framework. But why is collegiality, I guess, in your view, such an important thing? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're right that uh, there is a lot of difference among appeals courts based on tradition. Tradition is important to all courts, and and there are divergent traditions in, in the different courts. Collegiality, well, just it makes for better decision-making, first of all. And second of all, it makes it a nicer place to be. You, you get along with your colleagues. So the, the job is, is a lot better. One of the things that you read is that one of the unique things about the federal circuit is that all the judges sit in one building and they're here all the time. While in the other appeals court, they're spread out and they maybe they don't think about it as much because they do, <laughs> they're so far apart. But you say it helps with collegiality, but do you think being at the same time for so long can have a negative impact just in the way the federal circuit operates? Well, I don't. I wasn't suggesting that familiarity breeds contempt. I think that in the best courts that being together for a long time impresses on uh, each judge the importance of getting along, how someone who might be in opposition one day is going to be your third or second vote in another day. I think that the judges have to learn over the term that they're together for better or for worse for a long period of time, and you have to have a long-range view about it. Yeah, I remember, I think you said it took you like five years to get used to being a judge or what it meant. Mm -hmm. Do you remember anything like in those five years that surprised you? Yeah, I, I think that w one surprise to me, even though I argued a lot of cases in federal courts of appeals, w was how important the individual personalities are and the relationships are among the judges in, in terms of the work of the court. I should have known that because you could see from the D.C. Circuit where I argued a lot of cases that that was very much the case. But I, th I don't think an outsider can appreciate that fully in, 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 until you get on the court. Is there something that as a, an appellate advocate you can do with that knowledge of the fact <laughs> that the personalities matter? I think almost the opposite, that counsel are better off not trying to take the personalities into account and making arguments. Uh, I think you just got to present the same case that you would to any panel, and the, the judges appreciate that. I think that pandering to individual judges can be, can be harmful to counsel. You write about how dissents breed animosity sometimes. 
Uh, you say tensions often arise because judges take too long in producing opinions, particularly dissents, when a judge cannot reach a decision or change his position during the course of cases. And you wrote about your own evolution that you learned that dissents are not always serve a useful purpose. Why is that? Because sometimes, at least from what I read, dissents are celebrated as this independence and they're paving the way for the future, even though the current court might not agree. Why did you come to the conclusion that sometimes it's better not to dissent? Well, I think dissents serve, can serve an important purpose if the case is important enough to be a candidate for in-bank consideration or for Supreme Court consideration. And I'm not suggesting that dissents are a bad thing in that context, but disagreements are fairly common and often it's better to try to work with the majority and try to suggest changes in the majority opinion so that you don't have to dissent. And I try to do that, and I think my colleagues try to do that. And, and I guess when you say you don't try not to dissent, you're, you're saying you're trying to, you try to come around to their point of view or? Try, try to come to a bit of a middle ground in terms of the reasoning of the opinion and not so much a focus on the result, because if you're going to join the majority, you have to agree with the result. But the reasoning can differ markedly from one perspective to another. Yeah. And, and I know in some jurisdictions that it's almost an extremely rarity that there is a dissent. Do you think would it be a better practice almost to get rid of dissents altogether unless somebody asks for in bank rehearing or if, if that's kind of a prospect or the Supreme Court accepts a cert or something like that? Do you well, think? it's very much an individual choice. I yeah. think different judges are going to have different views about that. I'm acutely conscious having sat with the First Circuit for a number of years as a visiting judge that their tradition was very much to try to avoid dissents. They saw an enormous value in that. One of the things that you write in your book is about how when you joined in 2000, I believe, only 30% of a, a docket was patent cases. Now it's twice over that, and I, I think you calculated that you spent probably 80% of your time on that. You even took the time to write law review articles about how you prefer if it had more diverse jurisdiction, not if you prefer, but you think it would be better. Why do you think it would be better if the if it wasn't just all 80% of your time on patent cases? Well, I think when our court was created, Congress wanted us to be a generalist court. Yeah. And when I joined the court almost 25 years ago, it was more of a generalist court than it is now for the reasons you say. It's not just in terms of time, but in terms of the number of cases. I think it used to be about 30% patent cases. It's probably about two-thirds patent cases right now. And I think we're better at the job that we do if we have variety. And I guess that's what Congress concluded in the beginning. It's funny. In the patent bar, sometimes you hear the stories that the whole reason why the federal circuit was created was to improve the patent system. And that's what it's there for. I mean, if it's just a general court then somebody might say, well, well, what's the point then? Wouldn't just be another federal appeals court? Well, I mean, don't mistake me. I think that our exclusive patent jurisdiction serves an important purpose, and that indeed was a, a key purpose that Congress had in creating our court. I mean, the uniformity in patent law or a lack of uniformity in patent law was an enormous problem before the creation of the federal circuit. And I'm not in any way, shape, or form suggesting that our patent jurisdiction should not be exclusive. Yeah. Patent cases will always be an important part of this court's work. I'm just suggesting that a little bit more of a balance in the other direction by giving us additional jurisdiction over other kinds of cases, and particularly criminal cases. Every other yeah. circuit has a criminal jurisdiction. We don't. I think that it would be beneficial to us to share that experience with the other circuits of criminal jurisdiction. And do you think that would kind of inform you about the way you handle the cases that you handle, the government contracts and the patent cases you're on the federal circuit, or is it just because you're an appeals court judge, it should be part of your responsibility? I think that we value the communication that we have with other courts, and yeah. I think it, w it would help to make our experience more similar to theirs and, and help our integration into the judiciary generally. You talked about the lack of unanimity in panel laws. That's what kind of drove the creation of the federal circuit. Do you think there should be more specialized appeals courts, take a bunch of other areas and, and put them in? Or do you think maybe the panel system got straightened out, let's create another circuit and redistribute the judges from the federal circuit into that? Or no, no. I'm, not, I'm not in favor of breaking up the federal circuit for the reasons I said. I think it, 
that we perform an important function with our specialized jurisdiction. Should there be another specialized circuit? I don't have an answer to that. I mean, I'd, maybe in the in the tax area, but I, I think it's kind of unlikely that's going to happen. You talk about a little bit about the procedure involved and how decisions come from the federal circuit. I mean, on a personal level, can you give us like an insight? You have a case. Let's say there's compelling arguments on both sides. It's a close case. You'll be the judge, maybe writing the opinion. Can you walk us through how do you start thinking about it? What should the decision be? Well, our court in general, and uh, I in particular, spend a lot of time preparing for oral argument. I mean, days and and or at least hours for every case. So we come to the argument with a pretty good idea of what the case is about. And the decision that we make is an informed decision after the argument and rarely changes. But in writing an opinion, I find every time the case looks a bit different or maybe a lot different when you start writing the opinion than it did after the oral argument because you're doing additional thinking about it, additional research about it. And so your thoughts evolve along with the multiple drafts of the opinion. So I guess when you come to an oral argument, I'm, I'm sure you're keeping an open mind, but do you already know which way it's going to turn out? Well, you have a, yeah, you have a tentative view when you're coming to oral argument, and you're there to explore that tentative view with counsel and to learn additional things about the case. I, I think there's hardly an oral argument where I don't learn something new. I think the oral arguments are tremendously important. They may not change the result in all that many cases, but I think they probably, in a significant proportion of the cases, they change the court's approach, the reasoning of the majority opinion. And and sorry for asking this again. I guess I'm just fascinated by, you know, you said you formed a tentative view, but how do you form the tentative view? I know you obviously read everything and all the cases, but do you have an instinct after you read everything that's your instinct, or is it more systematic? Well, I'll tell you what the process yeah. is that I follow. I, As soon as argument week is over with from the previous month, I sit down with the briefs for the next month, and I start reading them. This is without any input from my law clerks. And once I finish reading them, I do a bench memo for my clerks. I don't have clerks do bench memos for me. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I say, this is, the, this is the way I see the case. I'd like you to write me a memo or a couple of memos on issues that I'm uncertain about, help me understand what the law is or what the record shows. And I sit down and I discuss it with my law clerks. I spend a lot of time bouncing ideas off them, talking it through. That's, that's an enormously valuable part of the preparation that helps me to get to the bottom of it. One of the things that has come up on my podcast is uh, Rule 36. People have passionate opinions about it. It's when the Federal Circuit basically issues a decision saying affirmed without opinion. In 23, it actually went down, but it's 15% of all appellate decisions from the district courts and 35 arising from the PTO had these Rule 36. How did that come about? And from what I understand, other appellate courts don't have it. D- did it bother you when before you joined the court that this was a... Uh, practice? I, I, it's not something I ever thought of before I, I joined the court, and I don't know to what extent other courts have summary dispositions. The Rule 36 cases are the vast majority of them are cases that probably wouldn't be argued in another circuit because they're basically appeals without a lot of merit. Yeah, I think in other circuits, those would never make the argument calendar or would be taken off the argument calendar. And in, in a lot of those instances, you'd have an opinion drafted by the court staff, and it would be non-precedential, and it probably wouldn't say very much. So I, I think our process is much better for the bar in the sense that in every counseled case, we have oral argument. We give people an opportunity. We give counsel an opportunity to speak to us, to present their case, and to try to convince us. So they have to balance that against the the Rule 36 dispositions. I think if we had to write an opinion in every case that we might decide that we would have fewer arguments, which I'm not in favor of. And inventor Molly Metz, she was unsuccessful in her litigation, but this is what she said on the podcast. She said, this is our life's, my life's work on the line. Oh man, I mean, it crushed me. And then it, on top of it to, to find out what that meant, which was They affirm, they don't agree, they don't disagree. And I'm thinking, how do they even know? It's been two days. Did they look at it? Are they too busy? 
You know, I mean, it's just, it's insulting. She says getting a rule 36 was kind of a level of pain on top of losing. Did, did you ask her how she would have felt if she didn't have an argument at all? I, I did not ask her that yet. So is, do you think the oral argument, that is where they, you see that the judges care about the case and they're kind of- Yeah, uh, and, and, and you have a chance to hear from them through yeah. their questions about what they're thinking. You have a chance to address those concerns. Yeah. You've uh, talked about your colleagues in the book, some who have stepped away from a court. Chief judges, Michelle and Rader, who have been on my podcast, they've talked about, they think the federal circuit has lost its way in, in some ways. They obviously love the court, they're passionate about it. Where do you think they're coming from? Do you think they have a point? I, I don't think the court has lost its way, yeah. and I don't know where they're coming from. I've not talked to them about their views about this, though I've read about it. In the very beginning of your book, you write about the work of an appellate judge versus the district court judges. That appellate judge can't just look at that one case. They have to really look about how it's going to impact the decisions on future cases. I imagine this is extremely difficult, especially with the workload number of cases that you have. Can you give us more insight about how you do that on the federal circuit? Well, I think we think about that a lot. I, and I think not only the authoring judge has to pay attention to that, but that's a large part of the other judges on the panel. And then when we have what's called a 10-day circulation, we send it around to all the other judges and we get valuable feedback, both from panel members from the and the full court particularly, on the issue that you raise, and that is what's going to be the impact on future cases. And sometimes people will make suggestions, well, uh, there's language in here that might adversely affect future cases in a way that's unintended, and often that language will be changed. Another thing that I hear from the Federal Circuit Bar is they say that sometimes on the morning of the oral hearing, when they find out who the judges are, as soon as they're assigned a panel, they know the outcome. Is that a problem? Well... I think the vast majority of cases that we have would come out the same way regardless of the panel membership. And maybe the bar is putting too much emphasis on the members of the panel when they're thinking about this. Because obviously there's panels, that's how the court operates. At least in the Delaware Chancery Court, for example, I think there's an obligation if you write an opinion and addresses any issue and there's another opinion out there, you have to address every other opinion out there. Do you think that's important for federal circuit panels to do that, or it's kind of an unrealistic? Well, I mean, the first principle is we're bound by stare decisis to follow earlier decisions. We can't depart from them unless we have it in bank. Yeah. But we tend to be pretty careful about discussing prior cases that are close, those are ar- that are argued by counsel to be governing authority. Okay. And, uh, and if we're departing in some way, or it's being argued that we're departing in some way, we're very careful to discuss the prior cases and distinguish them. Yeah, I think there's an obligation to do that, and I think we do do it. We don't ignore yeah. relevant precedent. Yeah, and I guess because of panel dependency issue, there's a sense that different panels are just approaching issues differently, and it's hard to reconcile the law. And they say, well, at least they, the federal circuit should do more en banc <laughs> decisions so that everybody's on the same page. And, and I think there's been a trend of less en banc decisions. But what do you think the patent bar is not appreciating about when they say more en banc, there should be more and more en banc decisions? I think their view about the di- divergence of our precedent is not accurate. I think our precedent is remarkably coherent in, in, in the various areas that we address. More in banks? I think in banks are difficult across the country. I think courts of appeals are not fond of in banks to have 12, 13 judges up there hearing argument, deciding a case. It's it's difficult. It's awkward. Mm-hmm. Panels of three work much better, and I think we only go in bank in the most important cases, and I think that's what it should be. That's the way it should be. You obviously were appellate practitioners. What do you think makes somebody in a particularly ineffective Federal Circuit practitioner. Well, I think there's no question about that. It's it's a willingness to engage with the court, to listen to the questions, to help to re- respond to the court's uh, questions and concerns. That that's the most important 
part of an appellate practitioner, and we make no secret of that. With the Bar Association meetings, we say that. And nonetheless, we have counsel who seem to be reluctant to engage in that process with us, but we do our best to encourage them to, to see it our way. When you were an appellate advocate, sometimes the client wanted the patent litigation attorney to handle the appellate argument, and you had some different views. I think that has changed, obviously, with the specialized appellate practice. Some people are like, Supreme Court, oh, that's all they do, they do, or that's how they market themselves, they do Supreme Court advocacy, some do Federal Circuit advocacy. I hear different points of view, right? Obviously, the person who spent 10 years on this case might know everything the judge might ask him forwards and backwards, but do you have any thoughts about what makes somebody effective there? Just do Federal Circuit practice if they do Supreme Court advocacy as well, or if they're do appellate arguments once in a while? Anything? Well, I don't think to be a great appellate advocate of the Federal Circuit, you need to be exclusively an appellate advocate of the Federal Circuit. Probably is helpful to have experience of arguing elsewhere, but uh, some familiarity with the way the court works and the traditions of the court, I think, are helpful to to counsel and having familiarity by having done it repeatedly is a virtue. So you talked about what makes good oral advocacy, actually answering the questions that the judges have. What makes a, a, an impressive brief? Well, in the patent cases, the, the briefs that explain the technology in a way that it's comprehensible, that's really hard to do. And that's one of the struggles that we have in the cases is to understand the technology before getting to the merits. A brief that is candid about what's going on, that recognizes that there's another side to it, that's not shrill, that's statesmanlike, that's objective. Those are the qualities that we value most. What about amicus briefs? Are they worth the time that everybody invests in them? What makes for one that kind of makes an impact in a case? Well, of course, the, the amicus briefs with the greatest impact are government amicus briefs in cases where the government's not a party. Yeah. But putting those to one side and talking about private party briefs, the, those that provide a different perspective. I mean, there are an awful lot of amicus briefs which just seem to be a vote. This is the way we'd like the case to come out. Yeah. I don't think those are particularly useful, but where somebody has a different perspective, which does happen sometimes, and it's uh, very helpful to us. What about briefs from like large lawyer organizations where a bunch of lawyers have to come up with some consensus about what they think the outcome should be? Does that have an impact because, well, they all think this way, maybe they have a point? Well, I, I, I think that in some of these important cases where there are multiple amicus briefs, that the amici and we would be better served if they got together to do a single brief. Everybody is operating under cost constraints, yeah. Yeah. and often there's a limited budget, and I've had this experience in private practice, a limited budget in writing the amicus brief. If you can get multiple clients to join together, the budget is larger, you probably write a better brief. I just saw from the recent unbanked decision, there was a, a lot of amicus briefs, and I thought it was interesting. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about the district courts and review about that. One of the things that you write about is because so many patent law issues are legal issues, they get de novo review basically at the federal circuit. There's a sense whenever some verdict comes out at district court level, everybody says, well, it doesn't mean anything until the federal circuit gets a chance to weigh in. Is that an issue that it's not more exceptional for the federal circuit to overturn what happened in the district court? Do we pay attention to jury verdicts? Yes, we do pay attention to ver jury verdicts. And I think we're acutely conscious that it's not our job to redetermine the facts that have been determined by a jury. And I think if you look at the cases, you will see that that's not just theoretical. It's practically true as well. With the district court, I guess there's been a lot of discussion about some districts are considered more favorable to certain side of the of, of a patent litigation versus the other. I mean, just thinking about it as a whole, does that trouble you? Is there a solution to that? Well, I, I don't think in terms of the substantive patent law being applied that there is a lot of difference among districts. Yeah. I do think there's some differences in procedures. I think some district courts are more willing to grant some judgment than others. I think some district courts are more willing to stay an infringement case pending the outcome of an IPR than uh, than other districts. Yeah. Uh, I think some districts 
are more able to address and dispose of patent cases more quickly than other districts. I think those, if you will, procedural differences are what distinguish the districts rather than different attitudes about substantive patent law. That's interesting. The last thing that you mentioned, the disposing of the cases, that, that does seem to be a huge thing because sometimes I see by the time the Federal Circuit decision <laughs> is issued, the first one, it takes it's like 10 years from the time the um, suit was filed. Does that trouble you? Well, yeah, I think it's troubling when any case takes a decade to resolve, whether it's a patent case or some other kind of case. And I, I don't think I can generalize as to why that happens sometimes. And I think there's relatively little that we as an appellate court could do about it. There's a lot of academics out there. And one thing that they do is they say, there's this issue out there. The federal circuit is affirming what the district courts are doing a lot on this issue. So that issue is very clear. While there's another issue where they're reversing the district courts on a lot, and it's not clear. Do you think that's a fair way to view that, that the fact the affirmances or the reversals by the federal circuit are an indication about whether there's clarity in the law? I don't think I can generalize about that. We are very much looking at each case as an individual case. We're not saying, oh, this is a case involving a particular issue, so we're going to insist that the district court follow some predetermined approach. That's not the way it works. It's, yeah. you know, we, and a lot of the empirical work that's yeah. done by that's, that's my question. Just about the empirical work. Yeah, the counting. Uh, the, I can't relate to that. It just doesn't make <laughs> any sense to me in terms of the actual judicial process. And can you talk a little bit more about that? What's the disconnect? Well, the disconnect is to assume that Judges are uniformly approaching a particular issue in one way or that it's predictable how they're going to rule on that issue in the case. I mean, I just the statistics that are developed sometimes vary a lot from year to year and in terms of how judges vote, and they vary from year to year because judges are just doing it on an individualized basis. You know, another thing that you're really honest about that I thought in the book was fascinating, you're right. Another difficult thing about being an appellate judge is dealing with cases with friends, former colleagues, or former law clerks are arguing. It is a difficult process, and the difficult challenge is not always met. Can you give us a sense? For people who don't do what you do, it's like, how could I do something against my friend or colleague or a former clerk whose career might be dependent on this decision or whatever it is? How do you put that aside, give us some sense about also the difficulty of doing that. I mean, you have to put it aside, and your job is uh, is not to decide cases based on your relationship with the lawyers, and you're proud to see your former clerks up there arguing. I've had cases in which I've had two of my former clerks arguing against each other. Uh, <laughs> and Were they co-clerks or uh, just different No, years? Different, <laughs> different years. So one won and one yeah. lost, right? But it's great to see them there, but I, I, I think you got to ignore that and focus on the issues. And I think, I hope I'm very successful in doing that. And I think my colleagues are successful in doing that also. But it's something that you have to be aware of. You can't allow yourself to be influenced by the fact somebody's a former clerk. I'm sure if you're a federal circuit clerk, you could go into arguing any appellate law. Do you think there's any value to having maybe a rule, I guess, if you clerk at least in front of a particular judge that you don't Argue in front of a judge or... Well, I think that would be pretty constricting on people's potential careers. We have a rule, and I forget exactly what it is, that you can't appear before the court for a particular period of time, and you can't appear in any case that was before the court when you were a law clerk. The court changes so much from year to year that I, I think anything that you learned as a clerk is not all that helpful with respect to individual cases in the future. What is useful as a clerk, you understand the tradition of the court, you understand how the court works, and probably are a better advocate as a result of that. Actually, that's interesting. You say the court changes so much year to year. What is a good way to stay in tune with how the court is thinking about things besides just reading the decisions? Yeah, I mean, that's what I would do if I were in patent practice, I would read the court's patent decisions. And yeah. that, that's the best window into what's going on. 
one thing that you write in the book is you actually represented an organization or a coalition that was in favor of getting cameras into federal courts. You said it was an act of love for you as well as work. Uh, but at the same time, you write that some things that happen inside courts, those shouldn't be transparent, obviously. And I guess I'm, I'm just curious about how you handle that. Obviously, you believe trans- some transparency is good, but why not the full transparency? Why don't we get to find out in 10 years exactly the recording of all the judges meeting and discussing a case? And Well, I think that would pretty much chill any discussion that, that goes on. There have been a lot of instances where people have gone back and reconstructed conferences at the Supreme Court or exchanges among the justices at the Supreme Court about particular cases. That's interesting as a matter of history. I don't think anybody would be interested in reconstructing that process here, and I think it would be very difficult to do it. I, I don't know what when you read those Supreme Court ones, does that ring true to you? Like when they reconstruct them? Does, like, Well, yeah, to some extent. I, I don't know. I mean, a lot of the reconstructions are not things that I know anything yeah. about. Yeah, some of them are, are accurate, and uh, they have uh, historically an intensity of feeling about each other, which is uh, remarkable and, and interesting. But I don't, I don't Does anybody care? What happened in this court 20 years from now, or yeah. <laughs> probably not? <laughs> you say actually one of the reasons why you want to be a judge is because you didn't want to retire from the legal practice. And you say it's a very important decision to decide. The most consequential decision for any Article Three judge is whether and when to retire. How should a judge, or how do you think somebody should go about making that decision? Well, I think the most important thing is you've got to make sure that you are able to do the job. And if you can't do the job, you should step down. And a lot of us, I think, have spouses or former clerks or friends who have the job of monitoring that. I think that's the most important criterion. Some judges step down because they like to do other things. And I have colleagues from other courts who've enjoyed stepping down and doing mediation and arbitration. It's yeah. not something that I would particularly like to do, but I think there are judges who have other interests. I mean, you know, on an appellate court, I think unlike a district court, there's a repetitiveness to what you do. Yeah. You know, I remember talking to Judge Clark, who was on the Fifth Circuit, who stepped down, retired, and went back into private practice. And I asked him why he did that. And he said, because of the repetitiveness. So it was all, it was the same thing every month. They brought me the briefs. I read the briefs. I had heard the oral argument. I decided the cases. I said, he said, if I'd been a district judge, I'd still be there. So I do think, I think there's more variety. And I do think that this repetitiveness or sameness of being an appellate judge can sometimes cause people to want to do something else, to have another yet another career after the bench. Yeah, I mean, you talk about how hard it's to be nominated and then confirmed. It's a, for most judges who become judges, it's a dream come true. And I'm always kind of fascinated why somebody steps away from that, especially after a long time. But one thing you say is that some discover that actually the what they thought greener pasture is not as green. What do you think they miss or about the work? You said there's a repetitive nature, but what do you think if you do step aside, what is it that kind of they miss the most about being in, in your role and being well, a Well, to be a decision maker, to be, to be relevant. I think it's really important to remember that once you give up the commission, you're not going to carry forward the kind of attention and respect that you receive as a judge, which you receive as a judge not because you're who you are, but because you you have the commission. And I think those uh, judges who leave the bench sometimes are surprised that it, uh, there's not the carryover effect that they might have expected. You served for, with uh, Justice Judge Newman for a long time. I- any thoughts you want to share about what was it like serving with her? And obviously, she's been on the court for a long time. Well, I, I always enjoyed Sitting with Judge Newman, I enjoyed having Judge Newman as a colleague, and occasionally we did panels together. I remember we went to NYU and presented ourselves as being close colleagues, even though we disagreed a lot of the time. <laughs> I, Judge, Judge Newman was a terrific colleague, and I enjoyed being her friend. You know, you've been around judges a long time, obviously now you've been a judge. What do you think is the most important quality a judge can have? Well, I guess humility in the sense that not to think too much about your own 
role in, in the judicial process and, and uh, recognize that what you do is important, but not all that important. And it's not about you. It's about the process. It's, actually, my favorite line from your book was that you went through this arduous process to get nominated and confirmed. And then you went out to dinner with friends and they didn't know what court you even got <laughs> confirmed on. And it kind of puts it shows immense hum- humility. It's important to you, and I guess maybe the patent bar, but beyond that, maybe not so yeah, much. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I think I think what the what the confirmation process tends to communicate to you is the question of whether or not you become a judge is somehow really, really important. Yeah. And once you're on the bench, after a few years, anyway, you realize nah, maybe it wasn't that important. <laughs> and and certainly you feel. I'm not as important as maybe they led me to believe during the confirmation <laughs> process. You said, you know, humility is important for a judge in general, but what about anything specific for a federal circuit judge? Is there something that you think it helps for a federal circuit judge to have to make them a good federal circuit judge versus maybe on another circuit or something like that? Well, I think the biggest challenge for any federal circuit judge in the patent cases in particular is is dealing with the technology. I mean, I guess in FERC cases, the D.C. Circuit has perhaps similar problems, but that's the, that's the greatest challenge I find as a judge here is, is just getting to understand the technology, getting the help that you need to understand the technology, because uh, I'm not a scientist, and even the, my colleagues who are scientists are not scientists in every discipline that, that comes before us. It's really hard, and we need help from the bar. We need help from our clerks. And we need to be willing to spend a lot of time to wade through it. Any final words of wisdom you want to share with the closing listeners? I hope uh, our court makes a a contribution to to all the areas that are within our jurisdiction. We we try our best, and uh, that's all we can do. Well, that's great to add on that. Thank you so much for doing this. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much for listening. Don't forget that new episodes of Clause 8 come out every two weeks, so be sure not to miss it by subscribing at clause8podcast.com or wherever you listen. 